this. So let's start the webinar and I'm going to hand you over to Jo. Hi there everyone, thanks Pete for that introduction. Um, now let me just see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, mm -hmm. There we go. So, oh, hang on a second. I'll have to flick through like that. Sorry, I've not got it on slideshow, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, good evening. As Steve, as Pete said, sorry, I'm Joe Pullman. I'm one of the kidney dietitians based down in Dorchester Hospital in Dorset. Um, and I also sit on the committee for the Renal Nutrition Group, um, part of the British Dietetic Association. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about eating and enjoying Christmas as much as possible, because at the end of the day, we want you to be able to enjoy Christmas as much as all of your friends and family members. So first up, as I said, eat, drink and be merry. That's what we want for you all. You know, we really do want you to be able to enjoy Christmas and the food and the festivities as much as anybody else. Um, and really, we want you to be limiting your diet only if you've been advised to by your kidney team. You know, we don't want you to be avoiding any foods unnecessarily or having a rough time for over Christmas if it's not necessary. Um, and what I would say is if you are in any doubt as to whether any of this applies to you individually, then I would encourage you to contact your kidney dietitian or your kidney team who will be able to tell you about your individual dietary needs relating to your kidney disease and your other health conditions and your blood results. So first up, plan ahead. And as we can see, even Santa plans ahead. It is so helpful if you can think forward about what might be coming up. You know, Christmas is such a busy time of the year. We've got so much going on, so many social things happening. And quite often, you know, time to cook, it just doesn't happen. So one of the things that we would say is, you know, things like batch cooking and freezing down portions when you've got time to do it can be really helpful. Um, or otherwise having some quick and easy nourishing meal options. So, you know, some good sandwich fillings available to you or things that you can eat that don't require much preparation. Um, just having those available in the fridge or in the cupboard so that if you are you know, pushed for time, then you can still have yourself a decent meal that you know is going to give you the nutrients that's going to keep you healthy and well. And as we always say, cooking from fresh is best if you can. So there will be times when, you know, you're pushed for time and you do need to have a ready meal or something that's convenience food. But if you can plan ahead like Santa and batch cook things and freeze things down, then you've got yourself a ready made, freshly cooked, ready meal, essentially, that you can just heat up really quickly and would be much better for you. But as I say, that's if, if you can. Obviously, you all will know what you're capable of. The other thing that's worth planning ahead for is things like your choice of snacks and nibbles. So there's always snacks and delicious little treats that are around at this time of year, no matter where you go. And um, many of them are going to be high in salt, potassium, phosphate or a combination of any of the three of those things. So it might just be worth thinking about that and keeping some more suitable alternatives to hand if you're entertaining and having people around or taking something with you so that you can enjoy a snack that's going to be suitable for you if you're out and about. So you know, things like um, popcorn or some nice shortbread or breadsticks, homemade um, tortilla chips, those sorts of things would all be very appropriate and fairly easy to, to arrange for yourself. So when it comes to managing potassium, we would say to you to limit potassium only if you've been advised to do so. Quite often people will start looking at diets on the internet and start avoiding foods. And we really don't want you to be avoiding anything that you don't have to avoid. However, if you do need to think about managing potassium, we're not asking for you to do anything other than what you would do on a normal day-to-day -day basis. And that's things like boiling your vegetables and potatoes or parboiling things before you roast them or do anything else to them. Um, choosing more of the lower potassium options. So things like peas and carrots and broccoli are much lower in potassium. Um, but 
if you did want to enjoy a small amount of some of the higher potassium options, so things like your roast potatoes or Brussels sprouts, roast parsnips, then then do do enjoy those sorts of things. But just keep it to a small portion and you know moderation in all things, as we've said. The other thing would be things like making gravy with freshly boiled water as opposed to using the vegetable water. So throwing the vegetable water away from when you've boiled your veg and using freshly boiled water from the kettle. And things like Christmas cake, Christmas pudding, mince pies, they're all really high in potassium because of the dried fruit in them. But if you did want to enjoy them, then there's nothing stopping you. I would say keep it to a small portion and don't have Christmas pudding after your Christmas dinner and then a mince pie or a bit of Christmas cake later on. Moderation in all things, but there's nothing to stop you having some of those things at all. So what about fluid? I hear you all ask. And again, we say to you, only limit it if you've actually been advised to. There's no need to cut down on fluid if you don't need to. Um, and when we do think about fluid, we're having to think about foods that have a lot of fluid in them. It's not just drinks. So I'm thinking things like the gravies that you've made with your freshly boiled water um, or things like soups or sauces, custard, ice cream, those sorts of things. So, again, plan ahead and manage your fluid allowance. So if you know that you're going out tonight and you're going to want an extra drink, then could you forego a cup of tea earlier in the day or could you use some smaller cups that's going to allow you to save on the fluid that you would have had in the day and give you a little bit extra to enjoy in the evening? And watching the salt or salty snacks. So as we know, salt is going to make you thirsty. So things like the crisps, if you're nibbling on those or other sorts of savoury snacks and um, things like sausage rolls or cocktail sausages, they're all going to be quite salty and that's going to make you want to drink more. So be careful of those sorts of things. And if you did want to enjoy a little alcoholic drink, then think about what it is that you're having there. And I would say to you to try and choose a short drink as opposed to a pint that's going to use quite a lot of your fluid allowance if you've got one. So things like um, a gin and tonic, for example, or another little shot of something with a little bit of a mixer there, um, or the cocktail that you can see on your screen there, those sorts of things are going to be much better in terms of managing your fluid. When it comes to phosphate, nothing changes about phosphate when it comes to Christmas. It's still there and it's still going to be in all of your food. So I would say, again, only worry about phosphate if you've been told to. But if you are prescribed things like phosphate binders, and you'll know if you are, they're the big tablets that you'll be asked to take with all of your meals, make sure that you're taking those. And even if you're eating out, so if you're eating in a restaurant or even if you're just going to dialysis and bringing your sandwich with you, then make sure you're bringing your binders with you if they are prescribed. It might be worth considering if you have got binders prescribed, whether or not you need to take some extra binders if you're snacking on some high phosphate foods as well. So if you're out and about and snacking on things like a lot of cheese and crackers or handfuls of nuts or any of those sorts of processed foods, as we've said, things like the cocktail sausages, sausage rolls, those sorts of things, they're all behind phosphate. So it might be worth having a chat with your kidney dietitian to see if they would suggest having an extra binder with those foods as well. And when it comes to your drinks, just bear in mind that things like cola based drinks are going to be really high in phosphate. So, again, it's just trying to choose a mixer or a fizzy drink that's going to be better for you. So things like lemonade or, as I've said, tonic water or anything that's not brown and fizzy, essentially. So to summarise, the key points is basically just to remember to keep to your personalised dietitian as advised by your kidney dietitian. And, you know, or otherwise somebody within your kidney team, there is no point limiting your diet if you don't need to. You know, we want you to enjoy foods. We don't want you to limit your diet any more than you have to because that's just miserable. Um, plan ahead as much as you can. So think about what food might be available to you, what snacks are going to be there and make sure that there's going to be an option that's going to be suitable for you. As I've said, things like batch cooking and making sure that you've got some quick and easy meal options for times when you're pushed for time to get out the door at home. If you're watching potassium, it's fine. Enjoy a high potassium treat in moderation, but remember that these will add up. So don't have lots of little high potassium treats through the day um, and consider having some suitable lower potassium alternatives available um, for if you did want 
So, you know, rather than your mince pies, for example, something like the individual fruit pies or little jam tart or things like trifle sponge puddings, much, much lower potassium alternatives. Think about fluid in your foods as well as drinks if you've been told that you need to limit your fluid intake as well. And finally, if in doubt about any of these things, then speak to your kidney dietitian or your kidney team and they'll be able to tell you what's what for you. Um, and last but not least, all that remains to be said is really, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas and New Year and that you really do manage to enjoy yourselves. Okay. Right, so now I'm going to unshare my screen, hopefully, um, somehow. Stop share. No, I don't stop share. There we go. Sorry, excuse me. I'm not very good at Zoom. Um, I think next up we have Stephen Miller, who is one of my old kidney patients who had a kidney pancreas transplant about just over a year ago. I think it was the anniversary of it last week, wasn't it, Stephen? Yeah, the 1st of December, we ah. just gone. Uh, yeah, my wife organised a surprise party to celebrate. So it was really good to celebrate one year. Well, congratulations. I'm, and I, I understand it's still functioning well and you're keeping really well in yourself. So that's great. Um, yeah, apart from today, I've got a, a, a nasty cold. <laughs> Well, that will always happen. So, Stephen, as I've said, you're one of my old kidney patients, and I'll leave it to you just to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about your background um, up until now. Um, I'm 36 years old. Um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was 12 years old. Um, growing up with diabetes was a struggle. I was always the odd one out of my, uh, out of my friends. Oh, Stephen, we are having problems with no, your then. sound at the moment. Oh, one sec. See if I'm not sure if your internet's um, playing up or what it is. Is that it? Just try again, and because um, we couldn't hear you very well. Is that better? That is yes. Sorry, one sec. Trying to figure it out. Any better? That is, yes, thank you. Sorry, how, oh, I've turned everything off that I should do and it should be fine now. That's it, lovely. You were telling us about your kidney journey anyway, please go ahead. Oh, sorry about the noise. Um, yes, yeah, so I was diagnosed when I was 12 with type one diabetes and a lot of my friends gone to join the forces and I couldn't and I found that a real struggle. and. In the end, I misused diabetes quite a lot. Um, so I'm 36, like I said, but I was diagnosed with renal kidney failure about three or four years. Uh, and it was a shock. It was, oh my God, that sort of, I don't know what to do. The doctor that told me wasn't the best sort of doctor. Oh, I think... Unfortunately, I think we've lost Stephen again. His internet's playing up. What we'll do is we'll go back to Stephen in a little while. Um, I'm going to hand my you transplant. Over, I'm going to hand you over to Hattie now um, while we sort Stephen's um, internet problems out. So Hattie is a kidney patient. Um, she is full of life and she loves food. So I'll hand you over to her. Hi guys, so I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you should all be able to, ooh, which, which screen can you see? That's the question. Can you see? Yeah, a we big can see it. Yes. I'm going to quickly, really quickly make sure that I've got the right one. There we go. Is this good? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Okay. So hi, I'm Hattie. Um, and yeah, as Pete kindly introduced me, um, I have had two kidney transplants. Uh, I've been on this journey for a while, um, sort of ever since I was born. Um, and my sort of kidney sort of nutrition journey has been quite a chaotic one. <laughs> so I thought I would give you guys all a little insight into that journey today. So little bit about me, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'm 25 years old and yeah, I've had two kidney transplants. The first one was when I was two and a half, so I was only just sort of born. Um, and the second one was only last year, actually in July. So quite recent um, and sort of just almost reaching my year and a half anniversary, which is fabulous. 
Uh, I studied graphic communication uh, at Bar Spa University, really enjoyed my degree and getting to utilize it all now um, while studying, well not studying, while uh, being a social media manager, um, getting to create lots of fun content. Um, I also try and raise awareness for chronic kidney disease on Instagram, uh, sort of partnered being an ambassador with the NKF and also just on my own channel, sort of tell a lot about my story and my background and sort of my clinic visits and sort of my whole transplant journey, really. So oh, yeah. trying to raise awareness and show that kidney disease can really happen at any age. And um, it doesn't always just happen when you're signed on, but don't need to say they're participating. So my uh, post-transplant from last year, um, I thought I would give a little bit of background on my most recent transplant. Uh, so I actually had a lot of trial and error with medication. Um, I was on dialysis for around two and a half years. Uh, luckily, my dad was a match, which was incredible. Um, but yeah, there was quite a lot of trial and error, getting the right meds. I had a lot of um, trouble trouble with high blood pressure um this was just due to the kidney just not working anymore um so that was always a bit of a struggle but luckily when I finally got my new kidney which was an incredible moment um it actually started working immediately which was amazing and it created four liters of urine in the first hour which I remember a consultant excitedly telling me <laughs> straight after I woke up um, but yeah, I was sort of having dialysis and the whole sort of transplant really all through the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm still quite careful now sort of going out and socializing and things like that. But I'm sure a lot of you can relate whether you're sort of pre or post transplant on dialysis or just starting your journey that sort of COVID-19 definitely was an interesting time for all of this stuff to be going on. Um, but yeah. Post-transplant, this is kind of what my life looks like now, uh, going out with friends, with family, with my partner. Me and my partner have a camper van called Betty, <laughs> which we go on traveling with. Um, new car, got a lovely office in my sort of new house that me and my partner share. And yeah, post-transplant life is definitely very different for me, at least um, from my dialysis life. And I can tell you it is a lot better. <laughs> um, but moving on to the sort of more nutrition side of things. Um, I thought I'd start off with a few little pointers um, from like a patient's point of view, from my point of view on things to kind of look out for and things to think about um, to do with nutrition and chronic kidney disease. Um, so personally, I think it's really important to go through your blood test results. I know that most clinics, at least my one, um, my unit, did regular blood tests and used to give you printouts um, of your blood test results. So I think it's really, really important to look at those, know kind of the normal levels for all the minerals and different you know, tests that they run. Um, and also what your normal levels are, because sometimes what's normal for sort of the general public or what's known to be normal is not normal for each individual, especially with chronic kidney disease. So I think this is really important to sort of fine tune, you know, your knowledge of your own levels and make sure that you can spot things if they're not quite right. Um, you know, like Joanna said, there are dietitians and nutritionists available at units and sort of in transplant centers. So if you are struggling or you have any questions or you're just wondering kind of what the best sort of solution is to a problem you might be having with your diet and kidney disease, definitely speak with the dietitian or the nutritionist because they will definitely help you. Um, I spoke with mine at the Bath Kidney Care Center quite a few times, so they were very, very helpful. Um, yeah, and just generally try to balance your diet as much as possible. I know that's not always easy, um, especially when on dialysis there's quite a lot of restrictions and just not very fun things due to like fluid and potassium and all this kind of stuff. So if you know if you do have to restrict just make sure you are balancing it and getting some meals that you enjoy too because you don't want to just go crazy and not enjoy any of it so <laughs> make sure you're getting things in there that you enjoy um and yeah just drink lots of fluids sort of this is more post-transplant obviously not really on dialysis um due to the restrictions on dialysis i know with fluid but post-transplants i you know, drink lots of fluid, stay hydrated, um, but just make sure that it's varied. I had quite a lot of trouble with drinking too much water and sort of washing quite a lot of my minerals out. So a, a big tip from me is just make sure that what you're taking in is, is varied. Um, but yeah, just listen to your body, eat food that makes you happy, makes your heart happy, makes your head happy. Um, and yeah, just always keep in mind that sort of different people have different requirements and not every sort of two cases are going to be exactly the same. Um, but yeah, speak with your dietitian if you have any questions yourself. So a few of my sort of nutritional struggles that I felt during my journey is I, at one point, as Joanna sort of pointed out, potassium is quite a big one. I actually had too much potassium during dialysis and ended up in A&E from eating too many avocados. So don't be like me. <laughs> don't eat too many avocados and be an idiot like me. Um, but yeah, I was still trying to sort of live my old, you know, 
pre-dialysis life of having lots of avocado and poached eggs on toast, but that was not going to work while I was on dialysis. So don't do that. Listen to your blood test results and listen to your dietitian. Uh, but I managed to sort of curb that avocado addiction in the end. Um, yeah, not enough hemoglobin. That was another really, really big one. And occasionally I still do struggle with that, even though I've had my transplant now. Um, but I don't I don't know what it was post, you know, during dialysis. But um, it, it really was something that, you know, not enough RNS or near recordman could fix for some reason. But I guess, you know, this happens. This is something that does happen. And, you know, even though I was eating enough spinach to be Popeye, my uh, hemoglobin was still not cooperating. Um, sort of post transplant, I've really struggled with, you know, keeping enough sodium and, and minerals, like I kind of touched on earlier. Uh, I drink a lot of water. I drink between three and four liters now, um, but I make sure that I drink isotonic drinks and I drink sort of mineral tablets in my water um, just to make sure that my sodium and things like that are kept up. Just because I am consuming, and I'm I'm very small. <laughs> I should probably know I'm only four foot ten, so that's quite a lot of water for a small person to be consuming. So you know. For someone larger, that might be absolutely fine and your sodium might not drop. But for me personally, it makes my sodium go quite low. So I just need to make sure that I'm keeping on top of it. Um, too much calcium was another thing that I struggled with during dialysis. Uh, so I noticed this is one of the reasons I said to check on your blood test results, because I noticed that my calcium had gone quite high to the to the sort of top end of the normal limit. And I was having a lot of heart palpitations, sort of they were waking me up in the night and they weren't the same heart palpitations I'd sort of occasionally had before. And I noticed that my calcium was too high on one of my blood test results. So I just thought, you know, I'll just try and lower my calcium. I'll just see if that makes a difference. So I uh, spoke to my consultant, lowered my um, calcium supplements and sort of started having less calcium in my diet. And within about a week or so, it was fixed and I didn't have any more heart palpitations. So that's why it's good to just take note of what your results are and just sort of adjust things as you go along. Uh, because like I said, everyone will be different, but it's just finding what works for you. So my sort of initial post-transplant diet, <laughs> I, hope jo I hope Joanna doesn't have a little cry when she sees this, um, <laughs> but basically because my sodium was so low um, and I was getting sort of slightly nervous calls from the consultants post-transplant about how low it was, I actually was advised to eat as much sodium as possible, which went against every single, every single natural instinct that I had. Um, so yeah, had to eat as much as possible. Uh, isotonic drinks, as you can see, my lovely display of LucasAid <laughs> that I had on my uh, kitchen table. Uh, I was drinking lots and lots of isotonic drinks. Uh, they told me to eat loads of noodles, loads of cooked meats, loads of sort of McDonald's, all the stuff that's basically terrible for you, um, which was very bizarre just because it had lots of sodium in it. And of course, this did have slightly knock on effects to the rest of my sort of health, I suppose. Um, my periodically, my cholesterol and my glucose went quite high, um, which wasn't great. So since then, I've managed to sort of find the balance. Um, and although I do sort of have noodles and I do have leukosades, I kind of stick more to the water with the sort of mineral tablets. And I include a lot more vegetables, a lot more carbs and things like that. So it's more normal. My diet doesn't just totally look like this anymore, <laughs> which is much better. Um, but yeah, definitely take my uh, initial post-transplant diet with a pinch of salt, if you pardon the pun. Um, but this isn't the case for everyone. This was just my personal um, sort of journey with, with diet and kidney disease. So a little snippet with some nice little graphics into what my diet might look like now. Obviously, I said that it's not all noodles and sort of leukosade anymore. And luckily, I have emerged <laughs> into the lovely world of vegetables. So uh, this is my diet now. Many more greens, much more rice, sort of noodles, pasta, basically the same, but both delicious. Um, keeping up with protein, with eggs and sort of meats. Um, yeah, just loads of fruit, loads of sort of nuts and seeds and just all the good veggie stuff. So uh, yeah, I just try and eat as much variety as possible, but making sure that I am just keeping a slight eye on my sodium in my blood test results to make sure that I am sort of doing what's best for me. Um, and I've spoken to consultants before saying that it feels unnatural <laughs> consuming so much sodium and whether it is normal. Um, slash good for the kidney and they've said as long as the blood test results are within a normal level or normal for you that is going to be fine for your kidney so if you are having to consume something more than you think you should but your levels are still fine it's probably fine <laughs> but definitely check with your dietitian or your consultants just to make sure that what you're doing is you know right for you um because yeah it is different for everyone else 
So I thought I'd uh, end on a few little food for thought notes. Uh, don't be like me and eat too many avocados <laughs> or roast potatoes, seeing as we're coming up to Christmas dinner. Um, but yeah, just be mindful of what you're eating if you are on dialysis um, and just sort of take into account what you're sort of going through, uh, what restrictions or no restrictions that you have. Um, and yeah, just be sensible. Don't don't be silly like me. Um, listen to the doctors, but also trust yourself uh, and your body. If you feel something's not quite right, or you feel like you should be eating slightly more of something, or you feel like you're eating slightly too much of something, or your levels aren't quite right, and you have an idea on how to adjust them, then do speak with your consultants and, you know, vouch for yourself. Um, because it is your body at the end of the day. And if you have a sort of a gut feeling about something or you want to try, you know, a new avenue with tablets or diet or anything like that, do put it forward because some things are always worth trying. Um, but yeah, just generally, if you are in your sort of dialysis phase of treatment, then keep pushing on. I promise, although sometimes the tunnel is long, there is always light at the end. <laughs> and I can just promise you that, you know, after transplant it gets so much better not just with nutrition but with sort of your whole new lease of life you've got more time in your week you've got more energy like a lot more energy um and yeah life just really really gets a lot better so don't give up on yourself uh, I know that you can get there and I promise you that it will definitely all be very much worth it in the end <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. If you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, my social media sort of Instagram, Hattie Amelia is there too. If you have any questions that you don't want to ask on this webinar, but you'd like to get in contact later, then please feel free to message me on Instagram, um, you know, about anything kidney related or not. But I really appreciate you all listening. And yeah, thanks for watching. <laughs> thank you ever so much, Hattie. That was um, really, really good as usual. Um, thank you. Is Stephen still in the room? We had a few internet problems with Stephen and it was such a shame not to hear his story. So if you are still in here, Stephen, please let me know. No, unfortunately, it sounds like his internet has dropped out. He's um, He said he was having a few problems earlier on. So let's go to some questions then, because we've got lots and lots of questions for um, Joe and Hattie. Um, so we'll start off with... Um, one for Joe. What sugar or sweet alternative do you recommend? Um, well, in t it would depend on the person, really. I mean, if you want, if you are not diabetic um, and want to have sugar in your diet, then that's absolutely fine. In moderation, sugar is fine. In terms of if you were diabetic and after some sort of an alternative like a sweetener, then I would go with whatever your preference is. There isn't anything in specific that I would recommend or not. Um, it depends on what you're going to use it for. So I believe some sweeteners are better than others for baking, for example. Um, some people prefer the, the taste when it comes to things like stevia. Um, I would just go with whatever is available to you and whatever your preference is. Um, but obviously moderation in all things having loads of sweeteners isn't going to be great for you and just bear in mind that some sweeteners can aggravate the bowels and lead to slightly loose stools so if you have too much of them you can expect a trip to the bathroom um, but that's only certain sweeteners I would just whatever you fancy really now this is a festive edition of our NKF webinar mm. and chestnuts roasting on an open fire and someone's asked about chestnuts. Oh. Can you eat fresh chestnuts as a kidney patient? Chestnuts are going to be quite high in potassium. So if you have been advised to limit your potassium, then I would say go steady on them. By all means, have a couple of chestnuts if you want them. But I would go with moderation. If that's not a problem for you, if your potassium levels have been fine and you've never been advised to limit your potassium, then by all means, enjoy chestnuts. Now, I've got a feeling this is going to be an individual patient answer, really, but um, they've been told to drink lots of water. Does this um, constrict what fluids I can have in general? And also he's asked, what about Diet Coke? So as you quite rightly said, it's going to be an individual patient thing. So, I mean, I don't know why they've been told to drink plenty of water. Um, some people are told to drink plenty of fluids and sometimes people say water instead of fluids. So it may be that 
the person who's asked the question has been told just to drink plenty and that could be any sort of fluid so that will include things like teas or coffees or squash or whatever it is throughout the course of the day um i don't know why it would have been water specifically and then what was the bit about cola um could they have diet coke yeah i mean it, it, it Coke is going to be quite high in phosphate. So if phosphate is a consideration, then they would need to bear that in mind. Um, but otherwise, Diet Coke, absolutely fine in moderation, as with all things. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question? I think so. We'll find out in a little while. Uh, <laughs> so we're staying on the drink subject here. Um, this person, well, it's Heidi, because I love her question. I've been advised to avoid carbureted drinks like cola, lemonade, etc. But does that apply to champagne and Prosecco? Um, well, I always like to say to people that, well, I mean, it, it, again, it depends why you've been advised to avoid carbonated drinks. So I'm thinking about things from like, a, I would say, Champagne, Prosecco, how much are you actually really going to drink? Go and enjoy a blooming glass of Prosecco if you want a glass of Prosecco or Champagne on Christmas Day, by all means. Um, some people, I guess, maybe for gout, may have been advised to limit carbonated drinks. Um, I can't think of why you might be advised to otherwise. So again, it just depends on the reason. And I can't see why you can't enjoy a glass of Champagne. Come on, it's Christmas. <laughs> Good answer. That's what we wanted to hear. Wasn't yeah. it? So this one's for you, Hattie. Um, mm. It says, based on what you know now, is there anything that you would do differently earlier in your life? Uh, I think it's a quite good question, actually. Um, seeing as my first transplant was when I was so young, because uh, I was born sort of with kidneys that didn't work. If you're talking earlier in my life being sort of childhood and teen and, and sort of like early 20s, I don't think there is really. Um, I was very lucky that my kidney sort of first time around lasted 22 years. Um, and so it kind of had quite a good lifespan for a kidney anyway. Um, and I really enjoyed my life. I mean, I almost felt like I didn't have anything wrong with me, which sounds silly. And it's I know it's silly to think of having kidney disease as something wrong with you because um, that's not always, you know, a very nice way to put it um but yeah no I I don't think I would if you're sort of talking about my <laughs> my speech about uh, avocados probably yes <laughs> probably I would do that differently um I think now that I realize how much of an effect it can have and you know I've been through that and sort of come out the other side yeah I think I would have sort of stuck to the dietary requirements a bit more I was great on the fluid intake but it was just a little bit of the diet sort of situation that I found difficult to stick to um but yeah sort of early early life no I wouldn't change anything I'm very happy with my life and sort of enjoyed everything about it and everything about post-transplant life the first time around um and yeah more recently probably would have stuck to less avocados <laughs> but definitely enjoying life now so it all worked out okay in the end luckily brilliant thank you um someone's put here I haven't put their name but hi all super presentation so far um, thanks a lot. Quick question. Is the Cato diet proven to help with CKD? One for you, Joe, I believe. I'm guessing that that's the keto diet. And I haven't seen any evidence for keto diet being beneficial when it comes to CKD. I mean, there is some emerging evidence that's sort of coming out these days about sort of perhaps enjoying more of a Mediterranean style diet and more of a plant-based diet can be quite beneficial for people sort of approaching end stage kidney failure. So perhaps having less of those animal proteins and enjoying more proteins from sort of plant-based sources, so chickpeas, beans, pulses, lentils, those sorts of things, and enjoying more of the fruits and vegetables than perhaps dietitians and kidney teams would have advised previously. But I would say, that if you're thinking about changing your diet, if you're thinking about following any sorts of different dietary regimes, keto diet or anything else, then do go and speak to your kidney dietitian. Or if you're not at the stage yet where you need a kidney dietitian, then go and speak, to, ask your GP if you can speak to a regular community dietitian or whoever, um, just so that you can sort of bounce some ideas off them and make sure that whatever changes you're making to your diet, it's still going to be balanced and healthy and give you the nutrients that you need to keep you healthy and well. 
And we have another question on diets. They put, um, I have problems with high blood pressure. Is the DASH diet good fit? Yes, DASH diet. So for those that don't know, DASH diet is reduced sodium or low salt diet. And salt is synonymous. It goes hand in hand with high blood pressure. So, I mean, we would say to any and all kidney patients, no matter where you are in your kidney journey, that aside from Hattie, obviously, everybody should be following, uh, you know, a no added salt diet. So really try to limit the extra salt that you put on food, limiting the salt that's in your food. So, you know, avoiding extra salty snacks and things like that. Um, so if you've got high blood pressure, though, all the more reason to be avoiding salt and also salt substitutes. So things like your low salt or the lower sodium salts that you can get that are potassium based. Um, so, yeah, yes to that. DASH diet, low blood pressure. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to read this one word for word because it put a smile on my face. Um, Tis the season for chocolates, crisps, cakes, mince pies, cheese and biscuits. Yes. Is it all right at Christmas? moderation in all things so absolutely um i mean obviously it's going to depend on what your individual blood tests are as to whether you even need to be thinking about limiting those things or not but absolutely go and enjoy a little bit of chocolate or some cheese and crackers or you know whatever it is that you want but just think small portions so don't go piling into don't go crazy over things now, if you want to enjoy things then do but be sensible and just bear in mind that having lots of little treats will add up through the course of the day, through the course of the week. So think about what it is that you actually really do want to enjoy and enjoy that over whatever else it might be that's just kind of there. And one more question just popped in. I eat a lot of white rice. Um, can't eat two scoops of rice. The dietitian recommends not happening, I'm afraid. Um, so I, I think they're saying, what about white rice in their diet and how much can they have? Well, white rice is going to be absolutely fine. There's nothing that's going to be harmful or problematic for the kidneys in white rice. And it's going to be a good source of carbohydrates. So it's a good source of energy. Um, I'm not entirely sure why he needs two scoops as opposed to one scoop. It's going to be. sort of. Oh, I see what he says now. He says, I can't eat two scoops of rice. Yeah. The dietitian recommends it. So the dietitian wants him to eat more rice than he can. Um, I'm not sure why the dietitian wants him to eat quite so much rice. And it's going to, maybe it's in order to meet his energy requirements or something. And in that case, if they're worried about that, then he needs to go back to his dietitian. Oh, need to eat less rice. Right. You you haven't looked as well now. I can see the questions. Yeah. So you need to eat less rice. Um, and I mean, is that because you're still hungry if you right, have John, less rice? Or I tell you what, John, take yourself off mute a minute. <laughs> Explain the issue. And talk to Joe direct then. That's the best way. Where are you? Are you there, John? She wants me to eat less white rice. Um, and John, is that because... You've got diabetes and the white rice is spiking your blood sugars or is it sort of a weight management thing if you don't mind me asking don't think he's on anymore i can't see him uh, actually so pre-diabetic in that case john i might suggest doing things like swapping your rice for brown rice is going to be a lower glycemic load or things like basmati rice might be a bit better for you um or otherwise filling your plates up with something other than the rice in order to keep you feeling full um, if that's still not happening and you still need more rice then i'd suggest going back to your dietitian and speaking to them about how best to manage the rest of your diet in and around that i think it's going to be quite a specific conversation that you'll need to have with your dietitian well thank you very much and that is all the questions we have um, thank you to joe to hattie um, and Stephen, sorry about Stephen's internet problems. Um, Stephen was a very interesting um, speaker as well, which is a shame we couldn't have heard him because um, Stephen is a kidney patient himself and he comes up with lots of recipes and he loves cooking and um, he's a chef at heart. So maybe another time we can hear from Stephen. Um, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you ever so much for attending. 
it has been recorded so it's on the watch again as well so um by tomorrow morning we'll have it on the in internet on the our website kidney.org.uk so if any friends or family members want to watch it they can have a very good christmas and um as joe says enjoy your food thank you very much cheers pete <laughs> merry christmas everyone merry christmas <laughs>